This is our ninth lesson in this series. And today, the chapter eight is kind of an interesting chapter because chapter seven, in chapter seven, Noah was in the ark during the, the storm flood part for five months. Chapter eight, the first half of chapter eight deals with the last seven months in the ark. A year and ten. Now that's a long boat trip. And uh, chapter 8 is going to talk about the last seven months in the ark. That's to try to bring you up to speed. So in chapter 6, you have the loading and of, the, of the ark. In chapter 7, you have the first five months in the ark in the storm. And then in chapter 8, the first half of the chapter 8, you're in the last seven months of the ark and then the disembarking from it. And so it, that's very important. Now, when you, study, when you study Noah's journey in the ark, you find something really interesting. You find a calendar. And therefore you find Noah, what happened is Noah kept a journal of his voyage. And if you've ever seen movies where there were people that were in caves or, or disoriented or something and, and would, they would mark the days on something like in a cave and, they, they, and then they would get to six and they, or seven and they mark through it. Apparently that, he, he had some system because he was in that arc a full year and 10 days. Now that's lunar calendars, lunar, that's a lunar calendar of, In 70 days, and he he and he and he writes a journal about it, and and we have great details about it, uh, eight wise, and and he and we're in no I call it Noah's voyage journal part two. He kept a great record of the first five months in it, and he kept a great record of the second five, uh, seven months, and so. Uh, it's important that, that you really get that. Now, we know, now, when it, when it, notice on your paper, when you look at um, Matthew, the 24th chapter, 37 through 39, that's where my subject matter came from. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So I thought it would be very interesting to go back and study for well, what was going on in the days of Noah that would be important to you and I in the day, because we live in the days of the Son of Man. And so uh, I've been doing that. And what I found to be really imp important to this study, chapter six, seven, and eight, is, is Noah's journal. The only way we know what went on was his journal. I mean, he kept a journal inside that ark. And he did really good on the first five months, and now you're going to see he did really well on the, on the last seven months in keeping a journal of everything that was going on. Well, I say everything, uh, at least the things that he wrote down that was important to us, I guess. And so, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of man. That, that's what's motivated me to do this study on this, to look for that stuff. Today we're taking a look. Now, here's what we know. We know that Noah entered the ark in 217, 600. Now remember, the 600 is his birth date. Like when we write down our calendar, we put down what, it, what is the year, right, uh, that we're looking at. But in this, 600 is his birth date. That's the way they kept records in the antediluvian period. And you, you, if if you've been, if you've studied with me, you've seen this in the first five months. He's recorded that. So uh, I, I put some information just to do a little catch up with you in my introduction. We're going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to look at four aspects of the second part of his journey, uh, voyage out of his journal. Okay. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. 
can't learn it nor live it. And carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue or vert. It should be confessed in silence and privacy. One passage, 1 John 1, 9, that I quote all the time. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That cleansing brings you back into spirituality and it brings you back into John 15. The principle of the Holy Spirit would teach and recall the word of God from your soul. So I give you a moment for confession of sin if necessary. And so, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way on a stormy day in Birmingham to study the Word of God, to have lunch. This is our, our Tuesday luncheon now. And uh, I thank you for these that have come with us and those who are dropped in by the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth about the second half of the voyage uh, in the ark today, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, you'll notice point one looks like a very long situation. It's, verse, it's the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 19, and the reason they're broke up, it's based on his journal. This is how his journal went. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at that. Uh, if you would, put your eyes on your scripture. In verse 1, God is mentioned, and we're not going to hear from him again until they disembark. And it's interesting how it's stated. It says that God remembered and God caused. Now, remember, they've been in the ark five months. It is at the end of five months, which is covered the ark has rested on a mountaintop, Eret, and that's the first four verses. And so when that ark comes to rest, it, it, he can't get out yet because there's still too much water. And so he picks this subject up in chapter 8. God remembered Noah after five months in the ark alone. A zoo. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark and God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water was subsided. Also, this is important now, also the fountains of the deep that, that produced a volcano kind of eruption of water and the floodgates of sky, listen what, were closed. That's at the five month. And the rain from the sky was restrained. The waters receded, i.e. from the wind, steadily from the earth, and, all the, and at the end of the 150 days, the water began to decrease. The, that's the first five months. Remember, you talk about lunar calendars. That's when the ark came to rest. And look, he documents in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mount, on the mountains of Arad. Okay? That's, that's, that's the first record that we get. That's the first record we get. Uh, as we enter the last seven months and ten days. Now, he don't know how long this is going to be. God didn't say it's going, you're going to be in the ark a year and ten days. He, he didn't tell them that. Now, notice in verse 1, now we, he's been in the ark five, five months. Notice what God did that Noah couldn't. What did God do that Noah couldn't? Noah was inside the ark. What did God do outside the ark that Noah couldn't do in the sight? Well, he says, yeah, well, he said, well, he, he shut the door, but we're in the fifth month. He caused a great wind. He caused a great wind to come, which is going to subside the, the water. Now, here's the principle. This is not on your paper. You got a pencil? Here's a really important principle. You know what that is for the guy inside the boat? For the guy inside the boat, that's logistical grace, isn't it? 
that's logistical. Listen, and here's what you've got to understand. While you're in the board, while you're in the ark in the middle of a storm, God is still active outside that storm in controlling everything necessary for you to grow in faith. Would you agree with that? Well, you need to learn that because this is life. What can we learn from this? What can we learn from the days of Noah? Well, there's one thing. And listen, you should write down Philippians 4.19. Because it talks about how magnificent logistical grace is. My God shall supply all your needs according to the riches of his grace in Christ Jesus. I mean, it's a powerful idea, isn't it? And, and you need to know that in the midst of a storm, you're still secured inside the ark. For us, that means Christ. And it's okay because God's taking care of everything around the storm. He's in control of the storm. You're not. Noah wasn't in control of the storm. God was. But Noah, God wants Noah to go through the storm, right? That's why, he's in the, that's why he's in the ark. And if he's outside, he's going to be destroyed. The water's going to destroy everything. And that's the worst scenario your life could ever be in. And listen, God is faithful to you all the time. You know, 1 Corinthians 1.9? 1 Corinthians 1.9? Do you know that? You should put it on your paper then if you don't know it. Because God is faithful. God is faithful. He's always faithful. And whatever your life is going through, he's in control on the house. Whatever you're going through, nothing enters the Christian life or touches it without divine permission, right? That's a principle we learned from the book of Job. So it's really important that we grab a hold of this enormous thing when it says that God remembered and God caused. And, and listen, this time, he's in a terrible uh, a windstorm, right? It, it, you know it had to be terrible because the water had gone 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain on earth. And that's, listen, at the end of seven months, God is going to take all of that water so that the surface of the earth is dry. Now think about, think about that that. that Listen, if, if you're an engineer, could you imagine what you were going to have to have by earth? Listen, I've seen houses that have, were flooded, and they bring in these great machines, and they blow everything. It takes, you know, it takes a long time to get that. Then you have to deal with mildew. And this is a flood across the entire God, God got it all back to normal. Now, it's going to be a new normal. I'll talk about the geography next week of the antediluvian world and how it was changed with the flood. He tells you exactly in, in Genesis, the, geographic, the geology and geographics of the antediluvian world was and how it was changed because we live in the post-diluvian period. Well, I just find this to be interesting. I find this to be interesting. Well, and... And uh, Rick was right. I mean, it says, and he closed, he, cl he closed off the, the water that was coming up and the water was coming down. No more of that. Now, we're going to get rain, but we're not going to ever have that again, right? We're never going to have a flood. We're never going to have so much money. We have li little floods, but they won't be across the world. The second thing is in verse 5. Look at this. And the waters decrease steadily. Now, you see, God has a, listen, I should this is glad someplace. But he's not injured. As far as we know, that he ran on the highest mountain of the antediluvian world that was convenient for departure. And that was probably 18,000 feet or better. That's how high that mountain is today, and it was probably higher than that back then. And, in a, and uh, the waters steadily until the, watch this, 10th month. We're in the 10th month now. Last time we looked, we were in the 7th. The waters de uh, deceased credit, uh, steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountain became visible. 
you know, the window they had in the ark ran across the top as a vent. <clears throat> so, you know, he was anxious that somehow to get up there and take a look around. And so we find in, ver in verse 5, the waters began to recede so that they could see the top of the mountains. A date is given, but remember, when you get to 600, you're talking about the age of Noah. You're talking about the age of a person. You know, you can't, that's not, we don't know what other than that that was. And uh, the window vent on top of that ark was important because he was able to look out and see what was going on. And that's the first time we know he did that. It's the first time he recorded it. In verses 6 and 7, then it came about at the end of 40 days. So we got an, he posted another date that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sent out a raven. And the raven flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. And he goes out and he doesn't come back. That's quite a, that's, that's, that's quite a reconnaissance that guy did. Uh, but he never came back. So we got 40 days, so we have another date. We've got 11, 11, 600. Then we get to verse 8 and 9. See, I find, what I find interesting in this story is he's running a, a voyage journal. I find that interesting. Then he sent out a dove. Now, that dove is going to go out three times. Watch this now. He sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abased from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her feet, foot, foot. So she returned to him in the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her back into the ark. Verses 8 and 9. Dove was sent out. How do we know seven days? Because of the next verse. Watch this. Then the dove found no resting place. Verse 10. So he waited yet another seven days. When the raven didn't show up after seven days, he waited yet another seven days. He sent out the dove, and then he waited another seven days to send her out again. In verse 10, so he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. Verse 11, the dove came to him towards the evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. What's that a symbol of today in the post diluvian period? At world peace. Isn't that interesting? How they grabbed a biblical, w w I bet you they're, wouldn't, they'll probably do away with it as soon as they find out that's a biblical concept. Well, they, <laughs> they'll probably do away with that thing. Uh, so no one knew that the water was abased from the earth. <clears throat> that, that's 10, 11, right? The key word in here is wait, he waited another seven. <clears throat> that's given us, he's posting dates. So now we have 11, 25, 600 when Noah finally knew uh, something about the earth. In verse 12, Then he waited yet another seven days, and he sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. And so we have him, the dove is spent, sent out a third time, and this time we're at 12, 2, 600, and she does not return. Verse 13, Now it came about after the 600th year, first year in the first month, Look at that date. The water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. All right? That's an important date to Noah. Record 1, 1, 601. That's really important. It is then that God did something really important. Watch this, verse, verse 15. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Do you know that for the whole trip on the ark, God never spoke to him one time? And he was hearing that kind of stuff. Never spoke to him. He never spoke to him. So, What's holding his mental state of mind together on the ark? From the word that God spoke to him before the trip. 
See? Sit back. You've got to be prepared for the things God is sending to your life, and he's preparing you by going to Bible study. You go to Bible study, you learn the word of God, you get in the midst of a storm, and you're recalling Bible doctrine that keeps you, keeps you from climbing out of the boat in the midst of a storm. That word of God is what carried him a year and 10 days on a boat in the most terrible storm you could ever imagine. The earth has never had a storm. The post-Diluvian world has never had a storm like he went through. And you need, to, you need to know that God is always preparing you ahead of time for what's coming. And that's your safety net. The word of God by, listen, listen to me. Look up here. Look, there's two things you have to know about faith. You got to know you have to walk by it. And listen to me, you have to fight by it. See, I'm confident that most of you in this room today know how to walk. I'm not sure you know how to fight. Because you're told to fight the good fight of faith. And what you're going to have to be prepared for is not just walking when it's good and peaceful and everything is going good, but to fight when times, when times are tough. Because it's still the will of God directing your life, agree? The will of God has not changed. And therefore, what God is going to do for your life has not changed. Your circumstance may have. Your circumstances may have changed, and your life has may, may, may be changing dramatically. But listen, God is still the one who calms the storm. And what calms it inside you is your ability not only to walk by faith, but to fight by faith. And that's really important that you, that you, that you know that. So in, so in verse 15, we have God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, verse 16, uh, you, 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 and your your wife and children uh, got too far there. Seventeen, bring out with you every living thing, the flesh, the birds, the animals, every creeping thing. Imagine all that on that ark, huh? That was a floating, floating zoo, wasn't it? That beats any zoo probably we've ever seen. That they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out. His sons, his wife, and his sons' wives with, them, with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their species or families from the ark. What a, what a phenomenal story. Listen. God spoke to Noah when it was over, not during. Listen to me. God spoke to Noah four times about this Enormous thing. I think I put it under point, point two. We are told in Genesis 8.15, a, a very important doctrinal principle regarding the directive will of God and how important it is to your life, whether you're outside the ark or inside the ark. And that is, God spoke to Noah, saying, directive will. He spoke four times. During the preparation for this trip of one year and 10 days, it is recorded that God spoke four times in, verse, in chapters 6, 7, and 8. God spoke to Noah two times at the beginning of building the ark, recorded in Genesis 6, 3, and 13, which we have already studied. I'm just bringing it back to a place to see the dynamics of how important the faithfulness of God is to your life. God spoke two times at the beginning of, of it. God spoke a third time regarding boarding the ark in Genesis 7-1. God spoke a fourth time at the end of the flood in Genesis 8-15. It is important for us to understand that what carried Noah and his family and the security of the animals, what carried them through the destructive flood with a peaceful mind is God's faithfulness to his word. Because during the trip, he never spoke to him. I'm, I'm confident that had he spoke, he would have recorded it because he recorded everything. 
Never spoke to him. So what's he living on? Spiritually, what's he living on? Spiritual food he's, he's digested, right? What he's digested. Here's point number three. God has spoken to us, the church age believer, out of the days of Noah for the days of the Son of Man. The things I've tried to show you today are very important to your life right now because as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. I'm trying to reach in and gleam the things that are going to be vitally important for your life. <clears throat> and I'm trying to record them for you. And one of the things that you need to know <clears throat> is the security. How was the days of the Son of Man going to end under divine judgment? What's, what's going to fire the first world antediluvian was destroyed by water you have to understand was how it was changed the post diluvian world is going to be changed by fire and you have to understand how it's going to be changed you need to know that the present world you live in is under divine judgment decree agreed I mean, we know, listen, we know from, listen, 2 second, second Peter 3rd chapter 5 through 9, he did out. He laid the whole thing out for us. And we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention in the days of the Son of Man that divine judgment is coming. Is it not coming? Just as sure as, as it came to the antediluvian period, it as as sure as it came and it did come, even the geographics of our post-Diluvian world proves there was a world flood. And I'll show you that next week. Next week. It, it's a... And you see, for us, it's Matthew 24, 37, 24, 37 through 39. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. I'm just trying to show you that. Today, for us... What is compared to the ark and Noah is Christ in the church, isn't it? And the ark did for Noah and the animals of the world was secure them. It was their safety net, was it not? And did Noah come up with this idea? I mean, as far as we know, he never went to engineering school. He may have, I don't know. Uh, He's a writer, so I'm sure he would have written it. But he was told to build an ark. There was no reason to have a boat because there, there, while there was water, there was never rain. I mean, nobody had seen. And it wasn't built like a boat like you think. It was like a box, a rectangle box in Hebrew. The same kind of a box that that Moses was put in and, and sent down the Nile River. Same Hebrew word. You know, remember that story? You know, the ba baby Moses? Eh, eh, well. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant, yeah. Yeah. But my point is this, is what the Ark was to Noah, Christ is to us. He's our safety net, isn't he? He's the way out of divine judgment coming. The only way out of divine judgment in the post living world is Jesus Christ. He, 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 sa he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but my, my, except through us. And the Father is the only safety net out of the post living world, and the ark is Christ. There is no other safety net. Boy, listen to me, the people on the Internet. If you think you're going to get out of here by the skin of your teeth, you don't have enough teeth nor skin. That's never going to happen. Christ is comparable to the ark of the safety of our period out of divine judgment upon the post-Diluvian world. 
It is Christ who will carry all church believers out of divine judgment of the fire by the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, just a few passages. Like the ark, Christ will be the only way out of divine judgment of our, of our civilization. We live in the post diluvian civilization. There's no way out other than him. John 14, 6. I love it when he said, no one. There's always somebody who says, oh, you don't mean no one. <laughs> right? There's always a person who says, you don't mean, you don't mean everyone. Well, I've been a good boy. What are you talking about? Nah. You got to be a good old saved boy. You got to be saved. No man comes to the Father but through me. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Christ died on a cross for your sins. We buried, raised from the dead third day. Paul called it the gospel. When you believe it, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God to save you. You can't be saved by any other power than the gospel. I was talking to a person the other day. It show you that sometimes we, we view things that unbelievers talk to us from a Christian viewpoint rather than uh, an unbeliever viewpoint. A we, this person, I'm having no problem of the gospel. Uh, I've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I said, well, I can tell you why. Because the word gospel there is a reference to the coming of the Savior. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's called the gospel of Matthew. It's called the gospel of Mark, Luke, and John because of the coming of the Messiah to be the Savior of the world. I said, listen, if you read the last three chapters of each of the books, you'll find out what the gospel is, that he dies for your sin, is buried and raised from the dead the third day. That's what Paul writes about. That's what Peter preached in Acts 2. That's what Paul writes about in all of his epistles. I found it interesting when they said, I don't understand. And then I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, I've read all of Matthew. <laughs> and I thought of myself, well, yeah, me too. I didn't know the difference between them talking about the gospel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John than what the rest of the, what the New Covenant Church is talking about. That person said that. I knew exactly because I was that guy. I was that guy. I thought Jesus Christ was a swear word, man. I didn't have a chance. And I realized in talking to that person, they didn't. They're called gospel, and they couldn't figure it out. The good news. The good news that Christ has come into the world. I've said, I, and I said, do you know John 3, 16? She said, well, I've read it. I said, well, that's what that gospel is talking about. About God sending his son in. Uh, to provide a way out of the world, I get John 14, 6. Nobody can get, no, nobody, nobody. I don't care how religious you are or non religious. I, it doesn't matter. Can't get there. Well, anyhow, I just, I just find it kind of interesting. And I, it kind of stunned me because I didn't, couldn't figure out what she's talking about until I talked to her a little bit. And then I realized that she, oh, she's talking about the, a gospel in completely different terms. Then I'm thinking, I'm thinking, yeah, Christ died for your sins. She wasn't. I mean, she, <laughs> she read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Where's, what's the gospel? I read the whole thing. I can't, I can't figure out what the gospel is. I said, well, yeah, I understand that. Isn't that interesting? I mean, sometimes, sometimes we, we overthink, don't we? We, we? Sometimes we over, we talk to Christians so much and, and such little time with unbelievers, we forget how they think. <laughs> And I went, oh, yeah, wow. I, I went, me too. I've been there. Point number four, before the flood, now this is really important because as it was in the days, Noah, so it shall be in the day. Watch this now, point four. Before the flood, the ark and the preaching of righteousness of Christ by Noah were visual reminders. Both of them were visual reminders to the people of God's promises of safety from the certainty of the coming of divine judgment upon the antediluvian world, i.e. the water. 
Did you get that? They had visual aids. The ark being built. Why? What's that old fool doing? Well, have you heard him preach? Yeah, he keeps preaching about the coming of God's judgment. And the only way out is the righteousness of Christ. That, that message hasn't changed, has it? Except that we've moved from a prophetic idea to a historical idea. Christ has come. That's, that's just amazing to me. They have a visual. And here is a, here is a guy, six, 600 years old or so. And, and for the last 120 years, this old man has been building. I don't know if he was old man. He lived to be 90. He's just like that. <laughs> right? He's middle age. Uh, he's building this, he's building this box, three-story box, and, and preaching every day, a crowd comes. Every time a crowd comes, he puts his hammer and preaches. That's in Christ. Judgment is coming. If there's a definite message these days, is that judgment is coming, and you need to be and Christ has prepared for what's coming. There's our message. It should be a strong message from our churches today. Stronger. This has been a great reminder to me. The Ark of the Preaching of Noah were reminders, were reminders that God's grace had prepared a way out of the divine judgment by faith in Christ. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us Listen to this. And God did not spare the ancient world, antediluvian civilization, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. They threw God and the message of salvation under the bus, so to speak. Right? And it left them what? What condition were the people of the antediluvian world in when the flood came? How were they identified by God? What's it say? Ungodly. They didn't have room in their heart for God, not one little speck of respect in their hearts for God. That's an ungodly person. And listen, they're born that way. They're born with a great need in their heart for God. And they fill, when they fill it up with everything other than God, they'll die ungodly. They'll die without God. Now, they think that's okay. I was talking to a guy yesterday up in Michigan, Whitehall. I'm headed up there this month. Yeah, May. I'm headed up there in May. I call him my missionary in Whitehall. <laughs> when I was a kid, Whitehall needed one. <laughs> but anyhow, that's another story. But... He's in a nursing home, and I call him my missionary. And boy, he'll, you spend five minutes with him, and he'll pop you with the gospel. And it just, I mean, he is, is every day he is, if you come in his room to clean, he's got you. If you come in his room, he's got you. It's a, you got an audience with that man. And his heart is broken every time. Because the these old people. <laughs> My grandmother was 90 and still calling the people she was with old people. <laughs> I love that. These old people, she would say, these old people. <laughs> grandmother, you're 90 years old. He said, they, 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 they say to me, I'll take my chances. Isn't that sad? I said, well, you keep telling them. And he said, I do if they come in my room or if I see them somewhere, I, I, I hit them up with it. You change your mind about this thing? No, well, you should because it ain't going to be what you think it is. So, listen, God did not spare the ancient world, preserve Noah, a preacher of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, a message for our age. Our people, he made him, God made him Christ, the son of God, who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That doctrine has never changed. 
It's always been that way. It will always be that way. That's positional righteousness. It will always be that way. So that as sin reigned in death, Adam's sin, Romans 5.12, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life. That's phase three, righteousness. Righteousness, just like sanctification, deals with the believer positionally, deals with, uh, deals with the unbeliever positionally, deals with the believer experientially, and deals with us as believers ultimately because of eternal life. Even so, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I conclude by saying to you that Noah's voyage journal recorded the faithfulness of God and Noah regarding the Lord's promise to both the godly and the ungodly. What a great, what a great journal. He had, it, it covered chapters 6 through 9. I hope you're writing in your journal. Yeah, Gary. I one time heard someone uh, speak about the Noah and the, and the ark. The outside of the ark is another word in the Hebrew for redemption. Uh huh. The inside of the ark was the same thing. One redemption they rejected. Right. One rede redemp redemp redemption they accepted. Right. But it was written on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, well, that preacher of righteousness would have had it on the wall, wouldn't he? <laughs> that preacher of righteousness would have had it. There's no telling what was on the inside of that ark, is there, other than scratch marks. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these to come our way to study with us the gospel of Jesus Christ through the story of Noah and the redemptive plan of God. No man can come to the Father, and that's the only place to be in security except through Christ. I pray today, Father, those that would understand that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give them eternal life. He is alive. The great story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is he alive and wants to be alive in your life that's dead. He wants to bring life, spiritual life, to your life that is dead without Christ. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our souls in Jesus' name. Amen.